recording. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning for the Regional Transportation Committee. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the chair of Dr. Cog. Today's Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. And we're getting started with the quorum at 8.37 and I call this meeting to order. Our first order of business uh, is I just wanna let everyone know that the meeting's being recorded and being held electronically because of COVID-19. And we will move to our public comment period. If any members of the public would care to comment, please raise your hand at this time. You'll find the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. There's a hand icon that you can click. And if you've dialed in by phone, you can dial star nine and a hand will appear on your, on your behalf. Are there any public comments this morning? Seeing none, that takes us to our meeting summary from the March 16th meeting. Are there any comments or corrections to the meeting summary? Seeing none, that takes us to our first action item which is the 2022-2023 uh, Community Mobility Planning and Implementation Set Aside Eligibility. Derek Webb is going to take us through a presentation on that before we have action. Derek, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Let me see if I can get the presentation up. All right, hopefully you all can see my screen. We can, it's not in full screen mode just yet. Does that look okay? Yes, it does, thank you. Okay. All right, well, thank you again. Uh, Derek Webb, planner at Dr. Cog, here to walk you through the community, community mobility planning and implementation set aside the eligibility rules and selection process um, updates for the FY 2022, 2023 cycle. Um, but I do wanna recap just what happened uh, last cycle. Uh, last cycle was our kind of inaugural cycle for this, this new set aside. Um, the, uh, if you recall, um, uh, hopefully many of you recall, but uh, this, this uh, set aside does work through a two-step application process. And so uh, during the LOI phase or the letter of intent phase of that application process, uh, we did receive 44 letters of intent from 19 sponsors throughout the region, um, 22 small infrastructure and 22 planning projects. Um, after conversations with those, uh, those sponsors, um, we did open up to the application phase, a full application. Uh, resulting in 33 applications uh, from 17 sponsors. Um, and the breakdown there was about 19 uh, small infrastructure projects and 14 planning. Uh, ultimately at the approval phase, uh, working through the Dr. Cog committees uh, and ultimately the board, 16 projects were funded, um, 10 small infrastructure and six planning. Um, this is just a recap that, um, that there are multiple um, set-asides uh, within the, the 2020-2023 TIP um, program. Um, the community mobility planning and implementation set aside is just one of those, those set asides. Um, but uh, real quick, a, a recap of what the program purpose and the goals, you will see a, a couple um, updates. Uh, they're minor updates, just wanna, just wanna highlight where they fit into the, the overall program. Um, the purpose uh, of the, the CMPI program or set aside is to support planning and small infrastructure projects that contribute to the implement implementation of key outcomes uh, within MetroVision and the MetroVision region, Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, the program goals you see listed here uh, should look familiar. They, uh, they come directly from uh, MetroVision and the, the RTP. Uh, we have added um, the, the last item there you see, the last bullet, uh, support a transportation system that is safe, reliable, and well-maintained. Made sense to, to go along with uh, the program goals we already had in place. Uh, we have added uh, priority emphasis areas, kind of like focus areas um, this, uh, this go around. Um, and ultimately projects that address one or more priority emphasis area are likely to be more competitive during this round of funding. Um, and we've added the, the following three, planning for or implementing active transportation, planning for or implementing safety, and planning for improvements in transit supportive land use along regional bus rapid transit corridors identified in the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, these emphasis areas relate directly to um, the, the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, we just felt like uh, it, was a, it was a good way to, to link the, the, the set aside uh, with uh, that updated plan. Um, just to walk you real quick through the funding availability and requirements, um, uh, the, the set aside itself is split into two pots, planning and small infrastructure. Uh, the the um, overall tip sets this up uh, uh, with 1 million for FY 2022-2023 in planning and 1.4 in small infrastructure is kind of the base. Those totals are subject to change. Um, and if you noticed in uh, the, the memo included in your packet, uh, there has been an addition of funding for both. Um, small, the small infrastructure side of the pot for this, um, this cycle um, has increased by $292,000 to, uh, to equate to 1,692,000. Uh, 1, 
On the planning side, that it has increased by $235,000. Um, so that, that total there is $1,235,000. Um, and that was uh, in response to some, some return funding um, uh, from the pre previous cycle. Um, applicants may request funding for up to two years. Uh, that is a typo, I apologize. That should say 2022, 2023. Um, and we have added for this cycle, uh, after some conversations uh, with CDOT, since they administer these funds, um, along with what we saw last uh, cycle with some of the, the, the planning projects and the small infrastructure projects, we have added the project minimums uh, set for $75,000 for planning projects and $100,000 for small infrastructure projects. Um, but we have not um, added a funding maximum, just like uh, the last cycle, there was no funding maximum. Um, sponsors are open to, to request um, um, whatever level of funding that they feel uh, um, they need to complete their project. Um, and as always, uh, since these are federal funds, there is a local cash match required of 17.21%. Sponsor eligibility, um, this has not changed uh, at all. Um, the key points here are that uh, for planning projects, um, non-governmental organizations um, must emphasize the connection between planning outcomes and implementation of projects by governmental partner agencies. So uh, any uh, nonprofit organization uh, that is eligible to apply must show that there's a, a, some sort of coordination um, or um, a partnership with a local government partner for those, those projects. Um, and then for small infrastructure projects, only local government, CDOT, RTD, and other governmental agencies are eligible. Um, nonprofits. TMAs, TMOs are not eligible um, uh, for the small infrastructure side of the pot. Um, a, a list of some eligible planning project types. Um, you know, these, these are projects that involve multi-jurisdictional coordination, regional collaboration, things that assist with public participation, uh, you know, feasibility studies, site assessments, um, studies or specific plans related to important local issues. Um, and also um, local vision zero or safety related plan uh, as a key, um, just calling that out as a key link to um, one of those priority emphasis areas. Uh, likewise, on the small infrastructure side, some eligible projects, uh, you, this, this is you know, small infrastructure. Um, so things like bicycle and pedestrian facilities, pedestrian supportive in infrastructure, traffic calming, road diets, all those types of things are, are eligible um, within the set aside. Again, uh, just to reiterate, this is a two-step application process um, that has not changed uh, since the last cycle. So there's a letter of intent and then a full application. Um, the full application, and this is kind of a simplified version here, uh, just to walk you through it. Um, all uh, interested sponsors or, or applicants must attend a, a CMPI application workshop. Um, Ultimately then, um, or at the same time, identify a project concept and begin early discussions with Dr. Cog's staff, uh, ultimately then leading to the submission of a letter of intent. Um, upon receipt of those letters of intent, we, uh, Dr. Cog's staff sets up a, kind of a, a, an LOI discussion uh, with that sponsor to, to walk through things like eligibility, competitiveness, um, project fit, that kind of thing. Um, and then applicants are invited to apply. I'll note that um, out of those 44 letters of intent that we did receive last uh, cycle, all applicants were invited to apply. We didn't turn anybody away. We just talked through, um, you know, again, eligibility, competitiveness, that kind of thing. And that kind of um, um, helped sponsors prioritize uh, their efforts uh, when they decided to submit applications. Um, so after that discussion, um, sponsors submit their application. Um, Dr. Cog's staff works through an internal um, project selection panel um, to uh, review and score those projects. And then ultimately we, write, we make a recommendation to the Dr. Cog committees and board of directors. And then at that point, applicants are notified about approved projects. Um, this kind of walks through the application review process. Um, so we, as I just mentioned, we, uh, Dr. Cog's staff establishes an internal review panel. Uh, the panel, will include staff from uh, the two Dr. Cog divisions here, uh, the Transportation Planning and Operations Division and the Regional Planning and Development Division. Uh, but it may also include staff from Communications and Marketing, the Area Agency on Aging and the Executive Office. Um, and as an addition to this, um, this cycle, uh, we have added uh, CDOT staff um, from um, Region 1, Region 4 and um, uh, Headquarters or DTD uh, as uh, advisor. Uh, advisors to the panel. Uh, they wouldn't be a non, they'd be a non-voting um, member of the panel, but just to, to provide some insight to some of the, 
the applications that we may be uh, scoring. Ultimately, each member of the panel reviews the applications and assigns points uh, based on the criteria and information contained in the application. We then convene to discuss the applications and reach consensus on the final total score for each project. And then uh, we work through that list um, uh, and again, take those through the Dr. Cog committees for review and final approval by the board of directors. So the next steps are the tentative timeline. Um, right now we're, we're with you uh, talking through the eligibility rules and selection process document. Um, uh, hopefully we, uh, we can move from recommendation here to, uh, to uh, approval with the board tomorrow. Um, and then um, next week we do have a, a mandatory application workshop tentatively scheduled. Um, in May, we will work through the letter of intent call. Um, and uh, as we receive those letters of intent, we will work through the letter of intent discussions. In June, the full application um, call for projects will open. Uh, July, Dr. Cog staff will spend uh, time, again, reviewing and evaluating those applications. And then we will work through um, uh, the Dr. Cog committees starting with TAC in August and then come back to you in, in September and the board of directors in September for a funding recommendation. That is pretty much it. Uh, happy to stand for any questions, um, but we are looking for, uh, for a recommendation to the board of directors today. Thank you, Derek. Do you have a motion that you can put up on the screen or you just want us to move uh, to recommend it to the board of directors? I think there's, I think we included one in the memo. Let me see if I can get to. Great. Well, I'll turn it over to folks for questions, comments, or potential motions to frame the discussion. First, we have Director Dale. Yes, I should know this, but how is the ad for the call for the workshop advertised? I, I, I know this, but I can't remember. How does it go out? How does it go out to the cities and counties, et cetera? So it went out, I believe, about three weeks ago, um, primarily through an e-blast, um, through email. Um, and it hit several of the, the, the Dr. Cog you know, managed lists we have. Um, and it's also been posted to the CMPI webpage on the drcog.org site. So it goes out to city staff, uh, what, the managers and community development or planning or how's that, what's, the, what's that uh, email list look like? All, all of the above. Um, I believe we use the tip, um, okay. the tip list. I've got a list of planning directors, planning staff. I also have a list of, um, of interested uh, planner, planning staff um, throughout the region um, that have applied or have been interested um, or have attended other, other webinars about the CMPI um, set aside. Um, so it's, it's a pretty large list. I wish I had the, um, the statistics up from, from you know, how, many, how many people it went out to and what the open rate was and all that kind of stuff I could share with you at this moment, but it, it was a large list. That's fine, Derek. Thanks for educating a guy who should know. <laughs> no that's a great question. Thank you, Director Dale. Great question. Are there any other questions or comments, or would someone like to make a motion? Uh, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question, Derek. Uh, I think I read in the memo uh, earlier that uh, there was uh, there were funds left over from the previous two year cycle that were rolled into this one. Can you tell us why? What happened? Um, no funds were left over. Uh, there were a couple uh, communities that uh, that returned funds. Um, okay. So most the the largest numbers that you saw here that I that I recapped um, right. came from RTD. Um, uh -huh. RT, RTD actually had a, a, a FY19 stamp uh, urban center um, project on the books uh, that didn't get going, and then uh, they had a, a small infrastructure CMPI project from last cycle. That was related to that that uh, stationary master plan urban center set aside program um, that couldn't couldn't get going either. Um, um, you know, obviously because of the situation that RTD isn't, so they they've returned those funds and we rolled them into the this uh, this cycle because it made the most sense. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to make the motion just to move the discussion along. Please do. I move to recommend to the board of directors the eligibility rules and selection process for the community mobility planning and implementation set aside for fiscal years 22 and 23. Thank you, Director second. Flynn. Uh, and the second was from Director Dale. Thank you, Director Flynn and Director Dale. Any more discussion of the motion or comments on this agenda item? 
And there's a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen you'll find if you wanna raise your hand. And if you're having trouble with that, you can just go ahead and use your mute and unmute button, which is on the bottom left side of the screen if you're trying to make a comment and can't find the raise hand button. All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for that presentation, Derek. That takes thank us you, to everyone. the next agenda item this morning, which is the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, or the 2050 MVRTP. Jacob Rieger is going to take us through this presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. Give me just a second. Okay, how does that look? It looks great, thank you. Great, okay. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, we are here after almost finally two years of the concluding presentation for the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. I'm gonna do this in partnership with my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, and Alvin's actually gonna start us off. Thank you, Jacob. Good morning, RTC members. We wanted to start the presentation off with just a quick reminder of the role the RTP plays in the region and some of the requirements that we meet as we develop it. So it does implement our larger vision in Metro Vision. It is multimodal, so it covers all modes of the transportation system, uh, the operations of the transportation system and the impacts of that system. It's also not a wish list. So all the products and programs that you do see in the RTP, we do think can be completed with the revenue available over the next 30 years. Just as the RTP implements Metro Vision, our short range plan, the Transportation Improvement Program implements the RTP. Uh, like Jacob mentioned, we're at the tail end of a two year long process, but we do an update like this every four years and we do it with all of our partners in the region. So CDOT, RTD, local governments, toll authorities, other transportation providers. And then we make sure to check a couple other of the requirements that we have as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. One of those requirements is air quality conformity. So the 2050 RTP has to address ozone, carbon monoxide, and PM10 pollutants. Uh, when it comes to air quality conformity for the RTP and the TIP, it is regional, so it's not based on individual projects, but it does include the transportation networks that are part of our regional travel model. And the 2050 RTP did pass all of its pollutant emission tests for those pollutants on that first bullet. Every plan cycle is a little different, so we wanted to highlight some of the unique ways we developed this particular plan. There was a focus on regional priorities, so throughout, the, throughout this planning process and our other planning processes, we've heard similar priorities from public and stakeholders, so safety, air quality, active transportation, freight. We wanted to carry those forward into our plan development process, so that led to particular developments for our scenario planning, as well as our solicitation and evaluation. So when we went to our solicitation phase, we received the most diverse list of project types that we have for the RTP before. That led to our most diverse list of project types in the RTP we're bringing before you today. We also included what we're calling programmatic investments. So while we don't know what some particular safety projects might be or active transportation projects might be, we do wanna make an investment over the next 30 years for those particular regional priorities listed. And then we have had innovative public and stakeholder engagement over the last two years. Foundational to the plan development process has been our vision needs. So the RTP rolls up all of the great planning work that's been done by Dr. Cog, all of our planning partners over the last couple of years since the previous RTP was implemented. So making sure that all of the great work that's happened is being implemented through our most recent 2050 RTP and taking into account other processes from the federal and state level. We think there's a lot of great information in the plan. Uh, there's four chapters and by the time this process is over, there will be 19 appendices. Uh, that information covers everything from a profile of the current transportation system to some of the measures that we look at and some outcomes we expect with our investments. Uh, for those who wanna get into the nitty gritty, like I mentioned, there are 19 appendices. So if you wanna get into forecasts, methodologies, analysis, our air quality documentation, you can find that as well. Great, thanks, Helen. Um, so as we've mentioned, the plan was really organized around the six priorities that you see on this, on this screen. Um, and these are the priorities, as Helen mentioned, that really kept coming to the top through our planning process, whether it was through our public engagement, um, through um, input from our committees and board, through our stakeholders. Um, so the plan really highlights these priorities uh, and the plan is organized around these six priorities. Um, and in terms of connecting some of the financial investments to those priorities, 
Um, again, one of those 19 appendices is the 2050 financial plan where there's a lot of great information about both the revenues and expenditures and how they're organized. Um, a lot of different ways to show that. This slide just happens to show um, how some of those uh, revenues and expenditures are organized around uh, some of the priorities in the plan. I um, also want to talk a little bit about the public comment period. Um, a lot of work has um, happened since the last time that we presented to RTC on the 2015 um, RTP. Um, as a reminder, we did have our 30-day public comment period uh, from mid-February through mid-March. Um, that culminated in a public hearing in front of the Dr. Cog board on March 17th. Um, we did a lot of, um, lot of different techniques to uh, promote our public comment period. You see some of those here um, on the screen. And then this screen actually gives you uh, even a better sense of some of the things we did during our 30-day uh, engagement period. Um, so I won't read through all of this, but just some highlights is that we did have, well, we built a social pinpoint site. Uh, so we had a, it was basically an online on-demand open house. People could come anytime. Uh, there were comment boards, discussion boards. There was online polling. People had a variety of ways that they could provide input. Um, the plan was um, pretty interactive so they could engage with the plan at the level of their um, interest and comfort. Um, we had a series of virtual public meetings during the 30-day public comment period. One of those public meetings was a themed uh, public meeting with Mile High Connects to focus on environmental justice uh, and transportation issues. Um, we also made several presentations in the range of like uh, about 20 presentations across the region virtually, of course, um, over the 30-day public comment period. And then on the right side of the screen, I won't go through all those statistics, but it really gives you a sense of um, sort of the, the interaction, the participation um, from folks during the 30-day public comment period. And we were really pleased, especially in a COVID environment, with the amount of engagement and participation we got um, during this public period process. Um, this gives you a snapshot. You know, one of the things I said we did during the 30-day public comment period was whenever we made a presentation, we did some Mentimeter polling. We asked the same set of questions throughout those 30 days. Um, again, this is not scientific in the slightest, but it just gives a sense of as we presented around the region um, and as we worked our way through the 30-day public comment period, you know, just kind of, kind of how people were uh, responding and interacting um, through, through that period. So we asked folks how well they thought the RTP, the 2050 RTP uh, will improve and how important um, the issue was to them of the six priorities that we've identified and we've talked about um, in this presentation. And we also asked how well the plan aligns with their ideal transportation system. So they had a chance to both um, you know, answer around some positive things, but also give their input on um, where they thought it was in alignment and wasn't in alignment. Um, so there was both the regular polling um, and then a little bit of a free response so that we could dig a little deeper uh, on those questions. Um, and then in terms of the comments we received during the public comment period, we received almost 300 comments. Um, so again, really pleased with the level of engagement. Um, the full sort of matrix, both the comments we received um, and Dr. Cog's staff responses is in Appendix C, uh, which is in our engagement uh, appendix in the plan. It's probably a little bit of a fool's errand to try and, you know, sort of summarize 300 comments um, and really not just those comments, but the Mentimeter polling, the presentations, you know, we got input in a lot of different ways, as I said, um, you know, so to do that justice, that's really hard to sort of, you know, how do you accurately summarize that depth and breadth of public engagement. So at the really highest level, um, I would summarize it this way, as you see on the screen, from the general public, uh, from those who took time to engage with us, strong support for the multimodal projects and funding in the plan, even more desired. Um, and that was a theme in our public comments, just really, you know, really wanting funding to go towards those multimodal projects. Again, from those who took time to respond, particularly those who responded in the comments we received, minimal support from the public uh, for road projects and funding. Um, interest in equity and environmental justice analysis was another theme from those public comments. Um, we did also receive comments from our local governments uh, that again, at the highest level, I would characterize as support for the 2050 RTP projects and priorities in the plan. Um, and a lot of good technical questions and sort of clarifications uh, requested revisions based on, based on the review uh, from our local government partners. And finally, we also received comments from our planning partners, CDOT, RTD, FTA, and FHWA. Again, at the highest level, I would characterize those as support uh, for the projects and for the planning process and some requested revisions to clarify methodologies 
uh, processes and so on, particularly from our federal partners. They don't weigh in so much on the merits of the content, um, but they do weigh in in terms of just, you know, how we're following our planning process and how we're, how we put the plan together and engaged with the region. Um, so again, if you're interested in this, I would encourage you uh, to look at Appendix C uh, to see the full list of comments received and uh, staff responses to those comments. Um, so with that, um, this is the motion that we need. I'm not going to read it to you, but I will leave it up on the screen. Um, I do want to end, though, uh, with some thank yous. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people to thank, and I'm not going to thank them all, um, but at a broad level, you know, to put a plan like this together, it really is the region's plan and it takes the region uh, to put it together. So that's not just our staff within Dr. Cog, although many, many staff contributed a lot of hours to this, our consultant HDR, um, our local governments, all of you, um, just everyone around the region. But in particular, um, I wanna thank the partnership of the agencies represented on this committee um, because it really did take that partnership to put together such a great plan. And I wanna recognize that um, and thank all of you. Uh, and with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions, and we are looking for this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jacob, and we would we would all be remiss if we didn't thank both you, Jacob, and Alvin for the care and professionalism you've shown in preparing this MVRTP. First comment we have is from Director Dale. Thanks, Jacob and Alvin. As you know, I've seen this about four or five times, but I always learn something. And I have a thing a lot, I really like roundabouts, and I noticed that the base one of the slides, there was data that talked about what I call stoplights or signals, but there wasn't any comments about roundabouts. And then I wondered from local governments, how much feedback you got about roundabouts, which I think contribute to reducing air pollution and, and congestion and a lot of things. So do you have any feedback for me on that? Yeah. I appreciate that, Director Dale. Um, so here's what I'd say. Um, I don't think we got any specific roundabout projects submitted as part of the plan. Um, we weren't necessarily expecting any because again, we're looking at sort of the big projects and the big investments, but I think you raise a really good point of the projects and investments that we have in this plan. What really matters is that how they're implemented, you know, those specific design details and um, you know, brass tacks of how these projects get implemented over time. And that's one of the things that we're focusing on in a companion project. Um, along with the regional transportation plan, something we're working on called the Complete Streets Toolkit um, to give local governments and others, you know, some of those tools to really think about when you implement a project and design a project, how it functions, how it relates to its environment, how you accommodate all modes of travel. Um, so I think that's really appropriate when we get down to the brass tags of project implementation. So you may not see something as specific as roundabouts at the highest level in the plan, but I think it's absolutely consistent uh, with what we're trying what we're trying to do and the themes that are in the regional transportation plan. Or, Madam Chair, follow up, please. Yes, sir. Do we have we ever, uh, as we planned and worked on Project Zero or in any of this, talked about roundabouts or an emphasis on them or trying to track them? Um, I'm not sure how specifically on on roundabouts per se, Director Dale, but again, I would envision that um, is to be part of the work that we're doing on our Complete Streets Toolkit. Um, and again, yeah. you know, for the 2050 plan, the projects are sort of, you know, this is a 30 year plan. So a lot of these projects are really conceptual and we're not on a lot of these projects to the point of understanding just yet exactly what they'll look like in terms of those design specifics. Um, so again, not so much on roundabouts just yet in the plan, but again, I do think it's entirely consistent with the intent of how these projects get implemented over time. And I think that's definitely a big tool in the toolbox. And Chair, if there's no hand, if there are no hands up, I could make this motion. You, you can make a motion to frame the discussion for us and then we can take the other comments and questions after. Great. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors to adopt the draft 2050 Metro RTP Regional Transportation Plan and associated Dr. Cog, Colorado and the PM10 conformity determination in the Denver Southern Region sub area eight hour ozone conformity determination. Thank I you. Would, 
I would second that, Director Williams. Thank you, Thank you Director Williams. And I'll just, Director Dale, it's a, I think it's carbon monoxide in there. Oh, CO. That's, I was trying to figure it out and I made it a call right instead of carbon monoxide. But so we'll, that's what comes we'll out of tailpipe. <laughs> yeah, we're looking at tailpipe emissions there. Thank you. So we yeah, have some comments on you. the question. And the first comment is from whoever's logged in as the RAC administrator. Yes, hello, and thank you. It's Mike Silverstein. I appreciate Hi, it. Mike. Hi there. Um, Jacob, could you describe a little um, for us how um, monies and efforts are devoted for bike lanes and sidewalk improvements in the plan? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the innovations in this plan that Alvin talked about was that um, you know, we've always had those topics addressed in the plan, at least at a, at a high level, but we wanted to be more intentional this time and actually encouraging project sponsors to identify multimodal projects. And we specifically asked for active transportation projects, safety projects, transit projects, et cetera. Um, so those, you know, those types of projects are specifically noted in the plan. They're included in the fiscally constrained plan. And then as Alvin mentioned, one of the other innovations is that not just projects, but we also wanted to create sort of funding pots dedicated to those priorities. Um, so in fact, let me come back real quick just to be intentional about this. So these six priorities, you know, we solicited and included both, you know, a set of projects, but also a, you know, a set of funding pots dedicated towards continuing to identify and implement these types of projects through the planning period. So again, whether it's safety projects or active transportation, meaning biking and walking projects, um, multimodal mobility type projects, you know, having those both, you know, project lists and funding pots in the plan, um, along with several other things is, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do to respond to you know, these regional priorities, multimodalism, but also frankly, is air quality strategies as well. Does that answer your question, Director Silverstein? Yes, great, thank you. Thank you, are there any other comments on the motion or questions? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for that presentation, Jacob and Alvin. That takes us to our next agenda item this morning, which is the 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, as we'll call it. And Todd Cottrell will give us a presentation on this this morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So there are two documents as part of your discussion and recommendation this morning. Um, one is the 22 to 25 Transportation Improvement Program. And the second is the air quality conformity determination documents. Um, these two documents are the same as what you just saw and approved in a 2050 uh, in your last item. Uh, so what is a TIP? So the Transportation Improvement Program is basically a short-term planning program that identifies the real transportation projects with the fiscally constrained federal and state funding. In other words, as where the RTP lists projects and programs anticipated with the reasonably expected funding over a 20 to 30 year period, the TIP is programmed with known funding or as well known as possible over the next four years. Uh, the TIP is uh, federally required and addresses all of the FAST Act requirements, which is the federal, um, the current federal transportation legislation. Um, per the FAST Act, a TIP is required to be created at a minimum every four years. Um, however, Dr. Cog does create a new TIP document every two years. Um, however, even though a new document is created every two years, the projects are selected every four years. Um, we essentially are creating a new TIP document every two years to align with the STIP or the Statewide Transportation Improvement Program that CDOT uh, creates a new document every year. Um, because uh, projects that uh, Dr. Cog selects are only every four years, uh, there was no new call for projects completed for this TIP. Um, and not only does it contain the projects that Dr. Cog selects, but also the projects that uh, included uh, from CDOT and RPD. And all of these projects help implement MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, the next couple slides outline some of the elements that is contained within the TIP document. Um, the first being fiscal constraint. Uh, so the TIP is required to include a financial plan that shows the anticipated revenues over this four year period are equal to or exceed the project level expenses that are included within the TIP. 
Uh, this financial information is included within chapter one and both table one of the draft tip. Environmental, environmental justice considerations. Uh, as contained within Appendix E, uh, the TIP reviews the, pro the projects against locations with a higher than regional average of minority and low income communities. The analysis shows no adverse effects in the distribution of these funded projects compared to those locations. Uh, performance measures. So this is another FAST Act requirement um, is the performance measures, which reports on the progress towards achieving set goals on the key transportation measures. Um, these include the uh, performance measures that you see on your screen. So safety, pavement and bridge condition, performance, congestion, uh, emissions, and of course, transit. Uh, those targets are in those targets and the number of TIP projects and funding dedicated to achieving each of those targets can be found in table two of the TIP document. Um, conformity finding. Uh, so Alvin covered this information in your last presentation. So I won't rehash what he's already mentioned, um, really just except to say that the regionally significant projects that are included within the TIP, so these capacity projects, uh, these were included within the networks, the network of projects used to determine the conformity and that all the budgets were passed. Project descriptions are also a key part of the TIP document. Um, these are included within the exhibit one. So each project can be individually shown or shown within a pool of projects and also includes important information such as the project scope, um, the cost breakdown by year, and of course, the location of the project. And finally, the public involvement. So the TIP is required to hold a minimum 30 day public comment period. Uh, the TIP and the conformity determinations were released for comment on February 10th, and with the comment uh, period concluding on March 17th with the public, he public hearing. Um, the comments received are included within attachment three. Uh, in addition, uh, we've also included a list of changes from the public hearing version of the TIP document to the action version, which is before you today. Uh, so attachment four outlines these changes. Uh, so that concludes the uh, presentation I have for you this morning. i uh, be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Uh, otherwise, your motion before you is to recommend to the Board of Directors approval of the 22 to 25 Transportation Improvement Program and the Associated Air Quality Conformity docu Documents. Thank you. Let's see if I am unmuted. Very good. So we'll start with Director Silverstein. Yes, hi again, and thank you. Uh, very, very nice presentation. Just a quick question on um, greenhouse gas emissions. Could you describe um, any analysis for um, GHGs that are part of this um, uh, part of this work? I know that it's not um, required for conformity, but it's it's important to understand what um, the trend line is for greenhouse gases. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I am certainly not the subject matter expert uh, to, to be able to answer that question. Um, I don't know if there's any other Dr. Cog staff on the call who may be able to answer that uh, way better than I possibly could. We'll turn it over to Ron Papsdorf, who will tell us what our plans are in that area. Ron? Hey everyone, Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Um, uh, Cheers, Tolsman, uh, Director Silverstein. Thank you uh, very much for the question. Um, it, as you noted, um, greenhouse gas analysis is not required. It's not part of federal air quality conformity determination. Um, we have we have not done a specific analysis of greenhouse gas emissions for this tip action. Um, you may recall, as part of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we did do some some um, greenhouse gas emissions assessments. Um, during the scenario planning work for the plan to help inform the development of that plan um, and to help give us a baseline since we do actually have a MetroVision um, performance measure and target for reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, per capita from uh, surface transportation. So we are tracking that. Um, obviously, as rulemaking and policy setting continues to implement House Bill 1261 at the state level, uh, we will once we have that rulemaking and policy setting uh, direction in place, we'll be we'll be circling back and um, reevaluating and figuring out how we'll how we'll more specifically do that analysis in a meaningful way. Okay, great. Thank you, Ron and Todd. Thank you, Director Dale. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, 
I was just reflecting and wondering how, if, if this big federal infrastructure bill is passed, and I know Congressman Perlmutter has got, given the call to the cities for projects, uh, would, would we play through Dr. Cog and, and Alec and make this kind of a tip project or will it be directed, you think, or does, any, does Doug know or does anybody know whether this, these projects will be related to the tip and the tip waitingness? Mr. Papsdorf? Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Dale. Um, yes, um, any, any transportation project that receives federal transportation funds is required to be included in the transportation improvement program uh, for for the region. So um, if a project is already in the TIP, then we're good. If um, we select new projects for new federal funds, then uh, we would need to amend those into the transportation improvement program. And if they are regionally significant air quality projects, then we have to do a new air quality conformity determination to include them in the TIP. So uh, the answer is yes. And there's a lot of uncertainty, as you know, about sort of new federal funds and what form they might take. Uh, we're watching that very closely in preparation for you know, the um, event. If, if significant new uh, federal funds do come and I'll, I'll, I'll preview the next agenda item for Todd and kind of uh, uh, preview this, but <laughs> we are intending after, after the next uh, item to work with our transportation uh, subregions to do a supplemental call for projects so that we have sort of a robust waiting list um, across the entire region ready to take advantage of any new federal funds that might become available. And we're, we're doing that as a precautionary step just to be ahead of the game and prepared for that eventuality if it happens. Okay, thanks a lot, Ron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Director Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Todd, could you uh, maybe as briefly as you can talk about how we quantify or measure environmental justice considerations, because it occurs to me that maybe with the new administration, uh, just looking for no adverse effect uh, on minority and low income communities, we might actually be asked to look for positive or beneficial effects. Uh, how did we measure the environmental justice, mm -hmm. uh, no adverse effect on, on this? And do we have a way of measuring beneficial effects on environmental justice communities? Right. Thank you, uh, Director Flynn. So in a nutshell, um, the, the analysis is completed through GIS. And um, through that, we look at transportation analysis zones where the populations of minority and low-income communities um, were able to map out those areas that have a higher than regional average um, of those communities that live in that TAS. Um, and then it's a simple kind of taking the existing projects we have, overlaying those uh, against those locations um, and it, looking for um, the, the no adverse effects is look, looking for a, a distribution within the actual projects um, that are relatively equal across um, all locations. Um, therefore, the end result is gonna show that we're not placing these uh, funded projects within areas that are excluding um, a higher than regional average of those minority and low income uh, mm -hmm. locations. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Director Shaw. Thank you. Uh, this kind of goes back to Director Dale's question. And I wonder if it makes sense for Dr. Cog to reach out to uh, uh, Mr. Perlmutter's office uh, to see, you know, if they're gathering, if they made a call for projects, maybe to uh, allow them the opportunity to share so that they could be incorporated or uh, share information because if the projects ultimately need to come through Dr. Cog that you know, and the TIP program that maybe they have that opportunity to uh, to direct them. Thank uh, you, Director yes, Shaw. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, um, I Well, I, I might let Ron comment a little more because I believe he's had a little bit more contact um, in Washington than I certainly have. 
Um, so I don't know, Ron, is there anything that you wanted to, to add to that? Sure, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Director Shaw, we, we, we have been in touch with all of the congressional offices in the okay. Denver metropolitan area. And I think there are a couple things going on, right? There's the administration proposal for a new infrastructure package that is still not very detailed. Um, we have very broad brushstrokes of what they're proposing, but a, a, a fairly significant effort uh, moving forward to actually make something happen there. Um, there's also, as part of the annual um, congressional, the um, federal appropriations process, and in anticipation of a new, re uh, uh, the next reauthorization of the uh, federal transportation bill, which is currently the FAST Act, so the next version of that multi-year authorization bill, is are, are both sort of underway now, and there has been a renewed effort uh, in Congress to have congressionally directed spending as part of both of those processes, otherwise known as earmarks. Uh, for those folks that have been around for a while and remember the term earmarks, uh, basically Congress telling folks how to spend a, a, a portion of money rather than through sort of a, our traditional formula and then um, regional sort of um, decision making process. So we've been in contact with congressional offices about those processes um, and giving them information about our existing transportation improvement program, our priorities and the regional transportation plan to help inform their, their own decision making. Great, you're on top of this, I love it, thank you. Thank you, Director Shaw, and I'll just recognize that there are several uh, members of uh, Senator Hickenlooper's staff that are attending the meeting this morning, so that's really great as well, so we can make sure that we're connecting all the dots there. So thank you both for attending this morning. Um, are there any other comments here, or would someone like to propose a motion? And uh, Mr. Cottrell, could you please remind us of what the motion that we're looking for this morning is? Uh, yes, the motion is to recommend to the Board of Directors approval of the 2225 TIP and associated air quality documents. So moved. Thank you, Director Shaw. Is there a second? Second. Second, Stan. I think I heard Shelly Cook come in first with a second. And um, so is there any more discussion of the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And we'll stay with Todd Cottrell for just a bit more while he tells us about the Transportation Improvement Program TIP waiting list funding uh, distribution. Todd? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I certainly would like to thank everyone up front for the time and effort that it took to get through this waiting list process, uh, especially for those who have participated in their forum. You know, this process has been one of the largest waiting list processes I think Dr. Cog has ever taken on, um, except for maybe the era process 10 to 12 years ago. Uh, this certainly rivals that process uh, in the amount of time that it took. So just wanted to begin a little bit with the actual waiting list process. Uh, so if you recall, Dr. Cog's staff began this process approximately a, a year ago, but then halted it due to dealing with the impacts of COVID that it had on the existing projects themselves. But the overall steps involved with the waiting list process include splitting the available funding, uh, advancing the existing projects, if that's the sponsor's desire, then of course, selecting some new projects from the waiting list. So for this call, Dr. Cat, Dr. Cog had a total of uh, just under $55.8 million available. Uh, approximately uh, 19.5 million of that was a mix of our regular funding types. So STPG, or surface transportation block grants, uh, CMAC, uh, congestion mitigation air quality, uh, TA funding, which is transportation alternatives, in the state uh, multimodal option funds, or MMOF. Uh, 36.2 million of this was the COVID STBG, STBG funding. So COVID funding came as part of the bill the president signed in late 2020, of which portions of this were allocated to MPOs. Uh, the COVID STBG funding acts just like regular surface tra transportation block grant funding with a couple of exceptions. Uh, so first, it must be spent by the end of federal fiscal year 24 uh, and can be used at up to 100% federal, uh, therefore uh, no match is required. So through additional CDOT recommendation and uh, discussions, it was decided that funding would go towards construction projects that could either advertise in fiscal years 21 or 22. 
Uh, if you take a look at attachment one, that includes the funding breakdown by subregion, uh, which is included in your packet. Uh, so a little bit about the waiting list. Uh, Dr. Cog began this process by talking to the first sponsor off of each waiting list, asking them, asking them if they wish to accept their, their available funding. Attachment two in your packet includes each current waiting list and the TIP policy protocols, which outlines this process. So as sponsors responded, uh, staff kept moving down their individual waiting list. If they declined the funding, uh, the project remained on their list. If a sponsor accepted the funding, they were bound to complete the scope with the local match rates that they, that they originally submitted within their application. Then the project was removed from the list. Overall, the decision to accept funding from a waiting list is truly a sponsor's decision and doesn't involve the subregional forum discussions and a recommendation. Um, however, there were uh, forum involvement in these discussions and recommendations uh, certainly was necessary due to two key items. Since the COVID funding uh, match rate could be used at up to 100% federal, uh, each forum needed to discuss and recommend if any project should be awarded this funding without providing local matches on their eligible projects. So another option for the forums was to swap in the COVID funding for some of the existing Dr. Cog allocated funding, which created situations where our project could use multiple sources of funding, um, some of which utilizes this COVID funding at 100% to fund projects where their overall match rates certainly were lower than the required 20% match. Uh, in addition, a majority of the forum waiting lists had either only a few projects on their list or their targeted amount to program was greater than the projects, the project totals on their list. So in these, in these situations, uh, Dr. Cox staff offered potential solutions, including, you know, either recommending new projects and or adding additional Dr. Cog funding to existing projects. Uh, I certainly would like to point out that many of the options recommended by the forums are either against the adopted TIP policy or involve situations where the policy is silent. So in those cases, um, as we run through these, I'll be pointing them out over the next several slides. And of course, that, that will be part of your action today. Um, so again, the next few slides outline the forum recommendations and if any variance, variances are needed in the TIP policy, um, for this recommendation to um, succeed. So first for the regional share, um, Denver had the first project on the list, which was their Broadway I-25 project at an amount that exceeded the target amount. Um, in the end, they did accept funding for that available amount. The second project, which was from Boulder County, um, was funded through their sub-regional process. And the third project uh, belonging to Broomfield was removed as it has been locally funded. For the Adams County subregion, uh, North Glen had the first project on the waiting list and accepted 2 million of the forum targeted amount. Uh, the next two projects both belong to the city of Aurora. They declined the funding and those two projects will remain on the list. This left a remaining unallocated a balance of $4.6 million. Uh, the forum ultimately recommended to apply the COVID STBG funding to a portion of the Bennett project and apply the remaining unallocated funding proportionally to the projects uh, to reduce their local match rates. Um, this is where we get to our first um, TIP variance, which would be requested. Um, uh, this variance is requested to add TIP funding to the existing projects. For the Arapaho uh, subregion, the only project sponsor to accept funding from the waiting list was Littleton for a study on Broadway with the remaining unallocated uh, target of $7.3 million. Their recommendation was to lower existing project match rates on existing projects. And of course, for this to happen, there would need a variance, which is to add TIP funding to existing TIP projects. For the Boulder subregion, uh, the subregion was able to get through their entire waiting list. Uh, skipping over four projects that declined funding, um, leaving the remaining unallocated balance at 188,000. Uh, this balance was applied to one of the two Lions projects. Uh, in addition, the COVID STBG funding um, at 100% was applied to both the Lions projects 
reducing their local matches below 20 percent. Uh, the variance requested for the Boulder County subregion um, is to add the unallocated 188,000 to one of the newly funded Lions projects. For both the Broomfield and the Denver subregions, uh, very similar. Uh, Broomfield was able to fund one of their two existing waiting list projects. Uh, uh, Denver was able to fund two projects, uh, one at the full amount and one partially. For the Douglas, uh, I'm sorry, they had the Douglas subregion, uh, Castle Rock had the first project on their list and was able to allocate $3.5 million of their original request. Uh, each of the remaining three waiting list project sponsors declined funding, um, leaving those projects on the waiting list. Uh, however, this left a unallocated balance of $699,000. Um, this, this remaining amount was added to the three existing projects to reduce their non-federal share. And of course, a, a variance would be requested to add TIP funding to these existing projects. Um, next is Jeffer Jefferson County subregion. So the county had the only project on the waiting list and did decline the funding. Um, the forum recommendation is to fund two new TIP projects and to add TIP funding to the existing Wheat Ridge Wadsworth Boulevard project. Um, in addition, the forum did make a proactive recommendation, which would transfer $1.6 million in Dr. Cog funds, along with the $400,000 in local match from the Wheat Ridge Ward Road project to their project on Wadsworth. Uh, this transfer will only take place if Wheat Ridge uh, decides to cancel their Ward Road project. Um, just to point out, this has not happened yet. Uh, so again, it's being proactive. If Wheat Ridge does decide to move that funding from Ward Road to Wadsworth, it will show up in a future TIP uh, administrative modification. Uh, so the TIP variances that are required, um, one is to select two new projects for funding. The second would be to add TIP funding to the existing Wheat Ridge Wadsworth project. And third would allow a transfer of funds from the Wheat Ridge Wadsworth project if Wheat Ridge does return their word road funds. Uh, and finally, uh, for the, the Southwest Weld Forum, um, both projects off their waiting list were funded uh, in addition to allocating COVID STBG funding at 80% to the two existing projects. Uh, and finally, there are some additional programming actions that would need to take place, um, just simply swapping out one funding source for another. Uh, next steps. So now that these actions are completed and there's been some recommendations set forth by the forum, some of the TIP waiting lists are now depleted. Um, so Dr. Cog's staff is requesting approval to issue a new call for projects. Um, attachment four um, outlines the adjusted waiting lists as they will look after action is taken on this item. So this will help us prepare for a situation um, if additional funds do come into the region before we get to uh, federal fiscal year 23, where according to the TIP policy, any new funding after that time would simply be rolled into the next call for projects, which is covering the 24 to 27 time period. Uh, this is especially important, obviously, items that we had just discussed, uh, the infrastructure bill and the fast act renewal, both on the federal level and, of course, whatever may happen on the state level. Um, I think the most important thing to point out on this new call for projects is that there is no, um, there's, it's not going to be associated with any new funding. So any projects that are selected and recommended would be added to the existing waiting list and just to increase the number of projects that are on those lists. Um, staff is proposing that if um, any projects are selected from this call, those projects be placed on the individual waiting lists after any existing projects on those lists um, in score order. Um, staff is also anticipating holding both the regional and sub-regional calls for projects at the same time using the existing applications that we had for the last call um, covering 20 to 23 and with staff scoring the applications and then convening a, a panel to validate those scores. We are also working through ways to restrict sponsors of taking advantage of, you know, submitting maybe a lower scoring project 
just to simply place them on the waiting list. Um, possible solutions include you know, restricting the number of applications and Dr. Cog um, allocated funding total to add to each waiting list so that at a minimum, there is you know, enough projects on each list that total around the same funding levels that are equal to one year's worth of Dr. Cog funding. Um, I think it's certainly feasible that not every project submitted would be added to the list. Um, and for those waiting list projects that currently exceed one year's worth of funding, um, no projects would be allowed to be added. Uh, finally, we're looking at a timeline of opening this call here, um, hopefully next Monday, um, with this closing on June 21st. Um, given this, we also expect to be able to bring this back to the board for action in September. So that takes us to the, uh, the recommendation that we're looking at this morning. Um, move to recommend to the Board of Directors the following actions to allocate the available funding to projects in the um, the 22 to 25 tip. Uh, this includes projects and the funding changes that are outlined in attachment three, um, the tip policy variances that I mentioned previously and that are outlined within the memo, uh, adjustments to the waiting lists as outlined in attachment four, um, to issue a new call for projects, to select projects for individual waiting lists, and of course, to administratively modify the 22 to 25 tip. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, happy to take any comments or questions that anyone has. Thank you, Todd. Could you start by just elaborating a little bit on the scoring that you'll, so when we did the first uh, tip, the subregions were scored by the staff members in the regions and things like that. Could you just elaborate a bit on the scoring of these new projects that are submitted in both the regional and subregional forums? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, so we anticipate conducting the scoring exactly how it was um, done within the regional share for the 20 to 23 cycle. So applications would be submitted directly to, to Dr. Cog. Um, again, we're still working through some of the logistics where perhaps there'd be some limitations placed on that. Um, those applications would come to Dr. Cog's staff. Um, we would check for eligibility. Um, we would go ahead and score those projects. Um, after we have completed those, the, the scoring of that, we would convene a panel. Um, this panel, again, last time consisted of one uh, forum member um, from each of the, the eight forums. Uh, we would also include RTD and um, CDOT staff. Um, the panel would be used to validate the scoring that Dr. Cog staff has done. Um, and of course, we could release those scores out with the placement on each of the waiting lists. So that will happen for both the regional and sub-regional projects? As proposed, correct. Thank you very much for that clarification. Any other questions or motions this morning? Director Cook. Yeah, quick question, Todd. Um, the Wheat Ridge Ward funding uh, in the Jefferson subregion, is that the BNSF um, grade separation or, and, uh, and uh, has Wheat Ridge indicated that it's likely or planning to um, return that funding? It, yes, it is the, is the uh, Ward Road over the railroad. Um, I have heard conflicting um, events over certain time period. I, I don't know at this time if that is a project they intend to continue with or not. Um, but if it does happen and they do decide the, to return the funds, um, we would certainly be looking to place that funding to the Wadsworth project. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Director Flynn? Hey, Madam Chair, if, if it's all right at this point, I'll make a motion and any discussion could continue, but just to get the motion on the floor. Thank you. Uh, I move that we recommend the following actions to the Board of Directors to allocate available funding to projects in the 22-25 TIP. Project funding and changes outlined in Attachment 3. TIP policy variances for specific subregional forums as outlined in the individual form recommendation subsection to allow programming actions. Adjustments to the waiting list as outlined in attachment four, issue a new call for projects to select projects for individual waiting lists and administratively modify the 2225 tip. Thank you, is there a second? Second, on Stanton. Thank you very much. Any discussion of the motion? All right, 
Thank you. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. That takes us uh, through our action items and to our first informational briefing. Uh, this is the 2022 to 2023 Unified Planning Work Program. And just because we like to have fun at these meetings, I'll just let everyone in on the fact that a few years ago, for some reason, um, Executive Director Rex made the mistake of telling us that he doesn't much care for it when we call it the UPWAP. So we will continue to call it that in perpetuity. So please, Take us through the informational briefing on the UPWAP. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was not aware of that, so I will have to refer to it as the UPWAP from now on. Um, just wanted to give uh, committee members this morning a, a brief overview and update on the Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP, or UPWAP. Um, this is one of the federally required documents that Dr. Cog creates uh, in its designated role as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region. Um, if you've seen the document, it's a very long list of all of the tasks that staff are engaged in over a two year period. It's used internally um, to plan out staff time and allocate agency resources as well as externally to communicate with all of you at our partner agencies as well as the general public on how federal transportation planning funds are being spent in the region over the two year period. Um, staff is currently developing a new UPWAP or UPWP covering federal fiscal years 2022 and 2023. The majority of activities are likely going to carry over uh, in some form or fashion between the current UPWP and the new one. Um, although we did outline just some highlighted changes in attachment one of your memo. So the top section uh, covers items that will be completed and will be moving out of the UPWP. So the first three bullet points there, you've seen presentations on this morning, including the current one, um, as well as the regional vision zero plan and the regional freight plan that were previously completed. Uh, the Complete Streets Toolkit is currently underway. Uh, the Complete Streets typologies are finished. Um, but the full toolkit will be completed by September 30th, the horizon of the current UPWP. Uh, the federal quadrennial certification process was completed in 2020. And then of course, our annual traffic congestion reports. Um, these, while the, for most of these, while the documents themselves will be completed, there will likely be some sort of implementation tasks in the new UPWP relating back to those. Uh, the lower section on this page shows some of the new items that will be added, including the new uh, 2024 to 2027 tip and its associated policy and call for projects, a, another new UPWP for 2024 to 2025, again, the annual traffic congestion reports. Uh, there will be an update to our federal performance measures during this time period. Uh, there's a recalibration of the travel demand model called FOCUS, which is one of the elements of our air quality conformity process, as well as a new Dr. Cog-led program for local technical assistance for small area and corridor planning. Um, so next steps for the UPWP document, including bringing the completed draft document to the TAC at their June meeting and then back to the RTC and board at your July meetings, uh, ultimately for board action. So at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions, comments, or suggestions that committee members may have. Thank you very much for that. Any questions or comments or suggestions from anyone on the committee this morning? And if you don't have them this morning, we can always, um, you'll find in the packet, uh, an email address there for Josh that you can send comments to after the meeting or your staff can send comments over to after the meeting as well. And I'm not seeing any hands. So thank you very much, Josh. And we will move on to um, other matters by members. Are there any member comments or other matters by members of the group? Seeing none. That will uh, take us to the announcement that our next meeting is May 18th and we are adjourned. I hope everybody enjoys their day. Thanks everyone. Great Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.